that we've been joined by Harsh Kapadia, who is the Chief Creative Officer and Executive VP at MRN New York. Thank you so much for joining us today, Harsh. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And so, Harsh, for those who've joined us who aren't quite familiar with what you do and a bit of your background, maybe you could just introduce yourself. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Harsh Kapadia. Um, yes, the spelling is just harsh, like the English word. Um, you know, in Hindi, it means happiness. In English, it works out just fine for me when I'm in, in the Western parts of the world. Um, I started my career back at uh, an agency that was once called J. Walter Thompson, now called Wonderman Thompson, back in Mumbai. Um, you know, I actually started um, with my bachelor's in commerce and economics and not in creative uh, with an advanced diploma in advertising. And if you know, if you know many Indians, you know, bachelor's is never enough. So while I already had a job in um, advertising with J. Walter Thompson, I needed to do something more in that. And I also felt a little insecure that I hadn't done a creative um, course, if you will. I learned a lot. I was very lucky to have my first ECD, um, Anirudh in India, who taught me a lot, really, and built my book with me um, and put me on some of the best briefs. But then, you know, the Indian in me said, I need to study a bit more. Um, so I moved to Australia and did my master's in communication design. Um, the reason I also went to Australia was they actually let you work at the same time as you study. And, you know, in advertising, you could be all of academia, but really it's the work experience and the people you work with that really matter. Um, so coincidentally, I ended up at J. Walter Thompson, Melbourne. Um, and, you know, I got to be with some of the best mentors who really groomed me in, you know, what is advertising really in the, in the modern, in the modern era. Uh, and my learnings from using culture in India, I was able to combine those two. You know, after a few years of, you know, learning more of the ropes in a different culture, learning the Aussie culture, you know, starting to get a little settled into Australia. And I got the trick question um, from my ECD in Australia, um, you know, and my mentor, would you move to New York? And I was like, is that a trick question? Are you just testing me? Um, you know, hedged my bets and said yes. And the next thing I knew, JWT New York was inviting me to come work for New York, um, you know, and so with, with things that I had, I was lucky enough to accomplish with, you know, new biz pitches, with awards, uh, putting JWT Melbourne a bit on the map, um, I was like, you know what, this might be a change, I could either change to another agency or change countries. So I moved over to JWT New York, um, you know, which was a very different culture, right, from Australia, even the same agency, it's a different country, a different city. Um, and, you know, I got to do work on some of the biggest brands, um, learn a very different way of working as well. Um, again, lucky enough to score some amazing mentors from this culture as well and kept in touch with my old mentors. Um, and then it was a chance to go uh, VML at the time, um, now known as VML YNR, um, started talking to me and gave me an opportunity to come over, which gave me a chance to work with you know, many brands like Legoland and Motorola, but then also uh, got me to work with Michelle Obama, uh, which was super exciting. You know, and then a few years of here, you know, again, you know, being lucky enough to have done some work that was recognized by international award shows, new business pitches. Um, you know, Debbie, our CCO, global CCO, asked me if I wanted to go run the London office. I was like, well, why not? I've already moved three countries. One more would be fine. Uh, which got me to London uh, and then oversee the merger of VML YNR um, and a few years in London and then uh, came back to New York, you know, continued to, you know, run some pieces of business like Google, which was really exciting and did some really fascinating work on that with the teams I had. Um, and then uh, about a year and a half, uh, Ronald Ung reached out to me and said, hey, listen, I'm starting at MRM. Would you like to come and be the CC of New York? Um which was, again, a new, exciting challenge and an opportunity. So that got me to where I am. Uh, but overall, I've always been lucky enough to have, you know, left on a high, if you will, from a place. I've, I've never really had to run away from a place, which I often hear from people, but I've been very lucky with the people I've worked with and, you know, actually had a blast with the, the partners and clients I worked with. So that, that, that was me trying to recap my life in, a, in a, as short as possible. It's some CV harsh and certainly at, at many of the top agencies in many of the top cities of the world 
So it's certainly some achievement. And whilst you're telling us uh, your journey there, you touched on something that we were talking about when we were chatting prior to this mm -hmm. conversation about about mentors and the importance of having good mentors in your career journey. Maybe you just chat a little bit about that, about how important you see that, even yeah, at I, the stage that you're at now. I think it's the most important thing. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I take mentorship from, you know, even at after having the title of chief creative officer, you know, um, I would say people like Ronald, my current uh, global CCO, Debbie Van Dieven, my previous global CCO, um, you know, uh, there's a CD in um, Australia, Keith, who was my Australia, uh, my mentor in Australia, and Anirudh in India, like they all are constantly staying in touch with me, checking in on me, you know, they've all had different life experiences. Um, and I get the advantage to tap into all of them in different ways. Uh, but then it's not just creative uh, influences as well. You know, I've been lucky enough to have non-creative mentors as well, which helps me, you know, think about it from the business side of the world as well. You know, often creatives are not always taught to think about the business side. And, you know, that's where we start getting dependent on others. But if we actually take business as our priority, and I'm not saying when I say business, I don't mean number crunching and, you know, uh, <laughs> trying to get into the, the softwares that we don't like. Um, it's more about having business acumen because I think you'll be more strategic in the ideas we make, right? So, you know, I, I, and also mentors don't have to always be people that are higher title than you. They could be different experience than you. They could be coming from a different place. And, you know, there are mentors that you learn from, and then there are peers that you learn from. So there's a bit of a mix at some point. You know, you almost give your mentor permission to tell you when you're wrong. And then your peers, you kind of just subliminally learn from them. Like that's that's the way... I like to put it as, you know, it's honestly, I've been very lucky to have great mentors and continue to have great mentors who are always watching out for me. And, you know, what it actually does is it gives me the peace of mind to take risks and just be myself. It's not a worry of, do I need to watch out for myself? It's just do what I'm paid to do, do what I was hired to do, you know? They're really great insights there, Harsh, and um, makes me want to sort of scribble scribble notes furiously or write it, write a blog on the subject. Um, and also uh, in that introduction to yourself, you touched uh, on having worked in different countries and the different cultures. And again, we were chatting about that, how important it is to recognise individual cultures rather than just having this sort of blanket approach to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really important. You know, I think, um, you know, as I move countries, often I get asked, where did you like the work the most? And to be honest, it really comes down to which culture did you absorb the most and what could you do with it, you know? Um, and I've had experiences in countries where I'm told sometimes, it's funny, I don't get told I can't be on something, but then I get told a team might not be able to be on it because they're not from that country and they won't get the brief. And my response has always been, well, you know, the pressure is more on them. They got to learn the culture more than someone who's grown up in that culture. And you take things for granted. You know, I probably will take something culturally for granted, maybe in India, that a non-Indian creative who goes into India might go, that's the nugget that nobody's paying attention and could really pull the heartstrings. Because sometimes you take the most obvious things for granted and for someone coming from the outside might go, wait a minute, that is so powerful. Why are you ignoring that? Right. Um, you know, and I've seen that happen where, you know, the pressure is on the, the on, on that person who's not grown up in that culture, or who's the least expected to have cracked the brief because they come from it from a different place. They don't know what's right and wrong. They, you know, the more you can ignore what is, what is okay, what is not okay. You know, you have enough hierarchies in agencies to stop the wrong you know what I mean um, but if you start limiting yourself from the beginning you already narrow your not your brief but you narrow your spectrum of work you can come back with you know and and when I say right and wrong listen I I I, I do caution on that right it's 2022 you have to be sensitive to other cultures so I'm not saying the right and wrong of insensitivities I'm saying more the right and wrong of what's been done before and what's not been done before and how one might interpret something, you know? Um, 
you know, if you look at global briefs, you'll often see, you know, just from an Indian perspective, I always laugh when someone puts uh, the color run and says, that represents India. I'm like, Holi is like one festival. <laughs> That's not what represents India, you know, but I can also see how fascinating it might be for someone who hasn't celebrated that festival in India and goes, that's my shortcut way to do it in a global piece of work. It's an interesting uh, insight, Harsh, for you to be saying that sometimes you can be too deep in something when we're so conscious of having diverse teams, but you mm -hmm. can be too deep in something that if you're nationally, you know, if, if you were traditionally nominated to manage something because there was the India connection, you mm -hmm. might not see something because you're so familiar with it. Whereas somebody mm -hmm. from outside, which is sort of an opposite take on the usual reason for having right. diverse teams. Yeah, you know, I, I would say I think my journey of having lived in all the different places, I feel now gives me the permission. And some I just say sometimes the ability because there's no guarantees I'll have this ability in every meeting. Um, it just depends on the day. But it allows me to connect the dots that I may not have connected if I only lived in India. Right. So. You know, I will have teams will come up with an idea and go, you know what, actually, let's take that India and put it, let's take that idea and put it in the Aussie market or the Brit market or the or another market because this is way better there. And I'll give you a classic example. We were working on an idea um, here earlier this year. And it was funny, depending on which country we wanted to put it in, my response or my execution to that idea would change, right? So if it went to India, this I, this this particular idea would be ripe for WhatsApp. But if it was more in the US, I would have said it's ripe for Instagram. Versus if it's if it was the you know if it was the UK, it would have been maybe, you know, a site or a, a, a chatbot or something. Like so it it really changed my ability to how do you frame the right channel in the right culture to make sure it is easily shareable or does someone have to think about it? And I think that's very different. Like in the US, um, it's funny, and I'm very gen I'm generalizing here. When I ask someone if they're WhatsApp and if they don't, I often realize, okay, you have a lot of iPhone friends. You don't have enough Android <laughs> friends, uh, or you don't have enough international friends uh, who live outside the U.S. You know, um, so it's really interesting on how you know teams and people think. You know, one of the like sometimes I'll have teams present to me ideas in a WhatsApp chat, which just brings it down to like the simplest, purest idea. And it's not rambling on in a deck for like 100 slides before you get to an idea. And that's so important. We're talking about diversity, but then on top of that now, we're talking about whatever your campaign is, it's got to be suitable, suitable for so many different platforms that have completely mm -hmm. different needs. And uh, you were reminding me earlier that you were on the CAN jury for the uh, mobile. What was the title of the award, Mobile? It was the Mobile Jury, yeah. Mobile Jury. So what exactly goes on there, Harsh? And and what do you think are sort of the priorities that mm -hmm. you're looking for in these sort of winners for, for the mobile campaign? So it's so it's interesting. Um, I've, I've actually been lucky enough to judge mobile twice at CAN. And... Uh, with a gap of a few years in between. And, you know, the category has been the same at large, you know, our devices have almost been the same at large, right? Um, but culture has changed, you know, uh, technologies evolved and changed and how we interact with these technologies have changed. Um, you know, I would say the first time I judged mobile, it was, it was more about the creativity using the device, the creativity on the device, right? And this last, this year, when I judged mobile, as a jury, we, we talked about how an idea transcends the device. How does it use your environment? Um, and so the device almost is the medium or a portal through which the idea begins, but it might, might not end in the device. It might end with an environment around it, or you know, it's just a trigger to my experience in the environment I'm in, right? Um, you know, there, there were ideas all the way from real tone that checked on, you know, skin tones of photography. To me, that is transcending the device, right? Because it's it's taking into account the environment that are around us to, um, there was another idea that it was a mobile site that calibrated uh, storm data and told you what to buy from a supermarket. To me, that was such a powerful utility, but could be a business transformation idea if you looked at it from a supply chain perspective, from a crowd control perspective, right? I mean, all this happened on the mobile device, right? 
Um, and and I, I wouldn't be surprised if in a year or two we're talking about it's mobile, but you don't even see the device, right? Um, there are so many things. You know, there was a recent trip uh, I did back home to India, and you know, if you go to the malls or any of the places where there is, um, you know, security, um, you know, they often when they are on break, they're playing. I know either they're playing cards in the garage on the on the car bonnet or, um, you know, just entertaining themselves. And this time I saw something really interesting. These two guys were sitting down and they had a phone in the middle and they were playing a board game on the phone, right? And I was like, that's how integral this device has become to our lives. It's not about texting and messaging. It's not about Instagramming. There's so much more that happens and we don't even think about it, right? Like I still try to play board games with my kids like on the table, <laughs> but I'm sure once they can do it on their own, they're probably playing the Scrabbles and the Ludos and those games and you know, sna um, shoots and ladders on their on their devices. Like the tactile thing is, we don't even think about it as, you know, a device is still tactile for that generation. My kids are five and three. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if a, a board game will make it till the time they're 18 or it might make a comeback because you kind of need a break from this bright screen as well. It's a fascinating insight and it makes me think of other conversations we've had about CAN in terms of obviously you're being exposed to such a wide range of campaigns and become really obviously really immersed in the, the minutiae of it. But then there's the balance then, like you're saying, that you see these people playing the, the board game and they might not even realise the implications of it. It's mm -hmm. this balance, isn't it, of those who are really in the know, immersed in the world of marketing and advertising, but needing as well to recognize how is this going to be seen by somebody who doesn't doesn't know the backstory, isn't so invested right. in it. I mean, if you actually think about it, think about our behaviors in mobile. We don't even open our catalog anymore. Like my parents probably, when they first got that device, they opened the catalog, they saw what it could do. Now you don't. And if you don't know something, you just YouTube it, right? Um, you know, I recently got a car and there was something I couldn't figure out. I didn't look, I didn't open the catalog. I just YouTubed a tutorial and, ah, oh, that's it. That's easy. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't even want to read about it. I just wanted to hear about it, you know? Um, and, and I think that's where the behaviors will constantly evolve and change. Um, but I think sometimes you have to remember the human in the middle, right? I mean, often, actually, I wouldn't say sometimes, it's always remember the human in the middle. Um, and I think as a mobile jury, that's what we are always looking at, you know, even in the, the work this year was, you know, was, did this come from a real cultural or human insight? Was this a real behavior? Or did you make me go a hundred feet the opposite direction? You know, um, and often with creativity, I'll often tell my teams, intersect your consumer where they are. Don't try to take them somewhere completely different because that's way too much work at the end of the day, we're not just artists, we're commercial artists. We need to move the business through creativity. So um, we are familiar with you, Harsh, from the uh, creativity course that we have on 42 Courses. And that's how I first came across you. And I remember very well the piece of video in the course talks about how we balance up uh, being uh, creative and getting creativity just from what's around us you talk about sometimes you might just be watching something on Netflix or and, and this sort of is the way people absorb creativity whether you're in an art gallery but for a creative we possibly see it in a very different way or we squirrel it away subconsciously and it, it pops up again what are the sort of things that you feel you take your sort of creative inspiration from? Oh, that's a, that's, that's, to be honest, a very loaded, uh, a loaded question, because sometimes I don't even know. Um, you know, I, I think the way I can best express it is just constantly being curious. Um, you know, something that might look mundane, but questioning even that, um, you know, I, living in Manhattan, I will often walk to work and walk back home. Uh, that 20 minutes of seeing stuff like literally yesterday I had a guy on a scooter just riding by me on the pavement but then was stopping at the, the, the at the lights to cross the road I'm like dude you're already on the pavement you're already breaking the rules keep going uh, you know you don't see that every day but that I'm sure somewhere down the line I will tell a team somewhere could that be in an idea you know um, 
you know, and, and it was funny. It's New York. Not one person even flinched or turned and looked at him doing the wrong thing. Um, and, you know, he was probably going in the, op- he was also going in the opposite direction of the avenue. So there were so many things about just that scenario. Um, and I was on the call with the team at the time and I sent them a photo of this guy. Now I've planted a bug in their head subconsciously somewhere. They might come up with an idea, you know, um, I think it's finding those obscure things. You know, sometimes uh, me and my old partner, Craig, will sometimes play this game of retargeting as well. You know, uh, if retargeting is done right, it can be done really well. And we will often play this game if you're messaging each other on different platforms, you know, including some of the ones that are encrypted or claim to be encrypted. It's a matter of time, how soon before whatever we are talking about, we're going to get advertised with something related to that. Right. And because I'm constantly searching all sorts of things, um, my algorithm is completely messed up, but I kind of embrace it um, to continue to mess my algorithm so that, you know, I'm getting to see new things and odd things and weird things. And, you know, um, you know, my wife's a graphic designer. And so it's kind of a parallel industry. We always differentiate ourselves of I'm advertising your graphic design. Um, you know, she more draws that line more than I do. Um you know, we're, we're kind of order, we're, we order people, I think, than, uh, you know, the purists of graphic design. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I'll often watch nonsense. I will watch my second screen is like playing all sorts of nonsense. And she's always questioning my taste in those things I watch. And I'm like, you know what, I'm just absorbing nonsense at some time, at some point, it'll mush it up and, you know, end up with something cool, you know. Um, sometimes I'll watch, you know, Hollywood to you know the shows that we're all used to to sometimes I'll watch a dubbed version of you know the South Indian movies which have over the top action which is like physics defying action scenes you just never know you you know these things get planted in your head and the next thing you know you're using it somewhere like I gave you the example of the security guys playing the board games you know I'm sure at some point that will get into an idea so I love to hear that story. Harsh has frozen this. I hope he unfreezes, but uh, I love to hear that story there about just watching the film. And my husband often walks in and asks me what I'm watching. Uh, and uh, we uh, can't tell when we're going to be able to use what we've um, been watching. So I hope Harsh unfreezes there. Chris had just asked a question that I wanted to ask him about whether curiosity uh, was innate in us so we'll just see if harsh comes back to us or whether we're going to be stuck with a frozen harsh for the rest of the event um seems to still be frozen so um i think what we might do is just see if he's oh yes he did say he would try to join me again he was concerned about his wi-fi connection so i'm just gonna Bring Harsh back in. Hello, Harsh. You're back Hi. with us. Hi. I'll just add you in there. Hi. You did anticipate that that possibly might happen. <laughs> so I managed to mumble away for a little while. Um, and Chris had just asked exactly what was crossing my mind when you were talking there about being out in the street and seeing things that for you, uh, you were curious about. Is this something that you feel you've just always had or do you think that it can actually be uh, um, sort of encouraged in people to be curious or is it just actually something that's in us I don't know I always thought it was in everybody so I don't know because that's how I always was Mm -hmm. Um, but if I compare it to um, you know my my younger sister who we both had a similar upbringing I think our levels of curiosity are polarizingly different. And there's a reason why she became a lawyer and I got into advertising. Um, you know, apart from the the other reason of every family member of mine is a lawyer other than me. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think curiosity is, you know, like I see that in my son right now. Like, you know, he's curious about things. And I would say it's not just curiosity, it's also observation. Right. Um, you know, there are things that him and I will observe and differently, right? Sometimes he impresses me on things he observes. I'm like, wow, you spotted that thing? Uh, That's pretty cool. Like this morning he was playing with Lego and he spotted a piece he's been looking for to make another set like two weeks ago. And I was like, you even remember you needed this piece? Like it was the most obscure piece, you know? So I I think, you know, there's a really interesting talk from um, Ken Robinson on, you'll find it on YouTube or um, even TED Talks. 
how we don't become creative. As the older we grow, we lose our creativity, right? Because the pressures of the world tell us what's right and wrong, and we start self-policing. Um, you know, and because I come from a family of lawyers, I like to always, you know, work around lawyers. I always tell lawyers, you work for me. You got to help me get around this, not run into it and kill an idea, you know, um, and keep me out of prison at the same time. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's a more lighthearted prison, not a not a hardcore, <laughs> not getting into those kind of crimes. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but but I think that's where it that's where the fun comes in, you know, um, is when you can actually observe and connect dots of two things that were completely polarizing and no one ever thought of connecting, you know, a little bit like MacGyver, you know, MacGyver never had the tools he needed to get out of places, but he took the two things and somehow always got out of everything, you know, and so I'll sometimes even talk about cultural MacGyverism, something I've learned in India or Australia and connected to something I've learned in the US. When you fuse those two together, you get a bit of a MacGyver moment that looks different, you know? And some of you may not have even heard of MacGyver. So um, look up the original classic um, MacGyver show and you'll see it, what I mean. It's, it's, a great, it's a great term, Harsh. Did you create that yourself? Uh, yes, <laughs> there, was a, there was an interview I was doing, you know, not that long ago. And I was talking about this. And I, I think in the discussion, it just ended up happening. Uh, you know, with this person who was interviewing me and it just became a thing. And now I'm like, you know, it's, I, I think those two words together just explains everything. If you know MacGyver. It's a, it's a fantastic term. And um, you were saying about getting the curiosity sort of drilled out of you as it were. And it is something that's often more related to the word childlike, childlike curiosity. Another thing that we don't see so much of these days, and I know that Rory Sutherland often comments on this, is sort of a lack of general humour mm -hmm. in in marketing, seems to have sort of lost that humour. Is that something that you're conscious of or concerned about? Or Well, um, you know, my team earlier this year created something called non-fungible testicles. Um, you know, it was an <laughs> And it was for testicular cancer month. And it was interesting how we actually presented this idea through the sense of lens of humor, but the non-fungible testicles was creating a parallel to the behavior we wanted people to follow in the real world of checking in on their testicles every month. We created an NFT where you had to check in on it every month. And if you did, you got traits for your digital testicles, which means it made it became more unique and the value would go up. If you didn't check in, you'd lose the traits and the value would go further down right and so making that as a behavior in in a more innovative channel on in a more you know forward looking channel made it top of mind for going oh if i got to check in there i probably have to check back in my on my real ones as well right so so humor played a role on that because you know it's funny every time uh you know we're talking to someone and we talk about oh yeah earlier this year we did non-fungible testicles the grin just doesn't go away um, so humor does have a role to play. I mean, you you can do purpose driven work. We did this for November. Uh, you know, you can do purpose driven work with a with a with a tongue in cheek humor to it. You know, it doesn't all have to be laugh out loud. It more has to connect to you at the human level. You know, not that long ago we did something with Motorola where if you ever owned a motor razor, you know, the the satisfaction we used to get when you used to hang up on people, right? Um, we took that as we looked at the data and we found that it was one of the highest hang up was one of the most positive terms for the motor razor. And when they came back uh, two years ago, you know, the brief to us was we don't have a new phone this year. We want to use last year's model. Can you help us stay in culture? And so we took the hang up uh, nuance and then we said, well, there is a lot of um, hate and conformity that exists on the internet, which we experience through the portal called our devices, our mobiles. Motorola being a flip phone with the nostalgia of the hang up is the only phone that can actually hang up on it. And so we created part of the influencers and we created thousands of GIFs uh, where the influencers are just hanging up on different topics of conformity, different topics of hate. And then we partnered with some TikTok influencers who even created a TikTok song to hang up on it. Um, you know, and so when you combine all that, gifts is such a lighthearted medium. You can say so much without upsetting anybody, but you land your point, right? So not the not the laugh out loud humor again. Not the it's not telling you it's funny, 
but it took a serious topic in a lighthearted way to, to, to almost diffuse the, the, the seriousness of hate and conformity, right? So those are just two examples that we've done at MRM in recent times, and then we continue to do more of that. But I think personality is really important in the work we do. And it can be digital, it can be non-traditional. It doesn't mean it has to get serious and very techy. In fact, technology should be invisible. Um, talking about digital, uh, there's so much talk about the metaverse. Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of role does that play in, in your planning at, at MRM? Is this something that is sort of you're very conscious of or you need to plan yeah, for? Absolutely. Or... No, metaverse is absolutely a priority for us. Um, I mean, the non-fungible testicles is a Web3 idea, right? Um, and there are, I mean, I think every week we get a new brief on clients asking us either to, you know, educate them more so that they can do something with it or what can we do? In fact, we probably have four projects right now that I'm super excited about, you know, coming out, you know, in the new year. Um, you know, I, I think it is... It is going to be a point right now, everybody's thinking about it, but at some point, it's just going to be natural to go between, you know, the metaverse and the real world. Uh, yes, there's a lot of naysayers out there about it. Uh, but remember one thing, the metaverse is a very large topic, right? Right now, people are including the crypto fluctuations, they're including the NFTs, they're including the immersive experiences you get in the, you know, the immersive worlds of the metaverse. There are so many things going on at the same time. Then how do you onboard yourself, get a wallet and get all the currencies to transact with and uh, you know, build your avatar. There's just so many things all hitting at us at the same time. If you remember back in the day when internet 1.0 came out, we started slowly. We started with email. We, I think we started with search or email, one of those things, right? Then we started with email. Then we started with a little bit more, you know, and, and things grew over time. With 2.0, we just added on some social platforms and, you know, uh, you know, a little bit more control. And, you know, we leveled up our craft in this world, which became more pleasing to the eyes. And then, and we also lost the dial up sound from our ears, right? Um, and now you reach Web3. And I would say we are in 2.5 more than 3 because 3 is more decentralized. I don't think humans are yet willing to give away control the way, you know, 3 is supposed to work. And I, I don't know if it ever will, you know, um, but then in this 2.5, we've been bombarded, uh, you know, during the pandemic, it fast tracked a lot of things. And we've been bombarded with so many buzzwords, so many things to understand. And life is going on at the same time. And two, two is going on at the same time. And, you know, there's a future state versus current state that are naysayers and there are yesayers. There's so many things going on at the same time. So the metaverse sometimes sounds way more complicated than it actually is. Um, you know, have we figured it out yet? No, uh, because we're constantly learning it. We're constantly learning what could go wrong with it versus what could be great for it. Um, the best thing is to learn bits and chunks at a time, but regularly doing it, because if you do it once and you forget it, that's it, you're going to be dated. Uh, that's the speed at which Web3 is and the metaverse world is working. Um, you know, in fact, a lot of people think to be in the metaverse, you have to wear your glasses and you don't. But there is a misconception because a lot of the editorial articles that go out there, you always see some person wearing those glasses and <laughs> sitting out there. And so most people are connecting that to, oh, you can't do it without that. And I'm like, no, actually, it's much bigger than that. You know, um, and that's just one example, right, on how perceptions get created versus you actually, you know, learning about it and doing it. And, you know, and sometimes we learn stuff on the fly, like the um, non-fungible testicles was our first NFT project here. And, uh, you know, we developed it in-house internally and, you know, we learned a lot from it. In fact, a, we used it as one, let's do great creativity. And it's a great idea. We had a very supportive client at November, but then we also used it to train a lot of our teams on what it actually takes to do a successful NFT project. It's fascinating to hear some of those projects. And also it interested me to hear that clients are coming to you and, saying you know uh, what is this metaverse or what what should be doing is there anxiety maybe about missing the boat or being left behind whilst everyone's charging ahead or I don't know if there's anxiety maybe there's a little bit of FOMO or there is a little bit of everybody's talking about this 
I think I need to know about this, you know? And then in some cases, in fact, with some of our clients, they've hired Web3 specialists, you know? So it really becomes helpful when, you know, when we have that, because then you're speaking the same language, you know? And, and I think sometimes it's also different brands and different clients have different appetites and different reasons, right? Um, and at the moment, a lot of our conversations are sitting around, you need to have utility baked into your experiences. Like it needs to be useful. Um, it can't just be, you know, those days are over where you're just sticking a JPEG into uh, an NFT and saying it's an NFT. I mean, don't get me wrong, that still happens. But an artist doing that versus a brand doing it are two different things, you know? And, and it's interesting how the terminology has changed as well, right? Because there were so many memes and those memes still float around. I can just copy a JPEG, but actually you own the JPEG, not copy it, right? Uh, it's like you could own a Van Gogh or you could you could print out a Van Gogh from the internet. It's not the same thing. Um, and, and even the, the industry started changing the term to calling it a digital asset so that it actually starts making more sense of, no, it's something you own. You know, uh, it's not just a JPEG. And I'm just using that as an example, right? There's so many of these examples. You know, we often talk about DAOs you know, uh, decentralized groups that help make decisions. How many brands are ready to take that on at the moment? How many, how many of us here would be ready to give away control? Like that's the other thing you want to think about. And if you give it away, who are you giving it away to? You know, there are so many unanswered questions. Uh, you know, there will be the early adopters. Like if you look at Nike, they've really invested big in this world uh, and they're reaping the benefits. You know, the, you know, we often tell clients, sometimes it's good to get in early because you do have permission um, to fail, you know, because everyone's trying something new. But once it's established, your permission to fail starts getting lesser and lesser because people, your, your, your consumers in your world become experts at it. Even if they are not, they have a point of view. You fail their expectation. They're going to have a, they're going to have something to say about it. It's just about where, at what point do you, are you allowed to miss the expectation because it's new or, past the expectation and then that becomes the new expectation. I'm so glad you just brought that up, Harsh, because I was just going to talk to you about in the world of creativity, we have to have, we often say we have to have the freedom to fail mm -hmm. and we want to be able to go outside our comfort zone without worrying that we're going to be be judged mm -hmm. uh, in what we do. And, and there you've touched on that there and it is a very important aspect of creativity yeah i mean you know it's tricky right um at the end of the day it is a business right you're going to supposed to move brands i think you can take risks but if you're strategic those risks don't feel as risky right if you have a good enough reason you know and i think i often tell creatives early in their career don't just be a creative for creative sake right we are commercial creatives you know we're not artists we are we're commercially minded with a really sharp eye to being artistic. You know, there's a fine line between the two things because as an artist, you get to do whatever you want. You, you are your own boss. As a commercial artist or a person in advertising, you know, whether you're a developer, an art director, a writer, it doesn't matter. You're writing a form of art to get people interested in the product or service you're trying to sell. Right. And it comes a lot of it comes from a human insight, a real product truth, you know, and how we talk about it, you know, and then advertising, the word advertising gives us permission to exaggerate it, to make it entertaining, to make it engaging. You know, that's really our job. Right. Um, how do we use new mediums and new channels and data to actually turn that into ideas that people feel like they're making a building a relationship between the consumer and the brand is where it starts getting interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have different levels of relationships with people, right? And, you know, if you want to talk to that favorite uncle, which brand is that? If you want to talk to your mom, which brand is that? You know, they all have different relationships and so do brands in our life. We've touched on so many aspects uh, in this conversation, Harsh. It's been really wide and I feel we've sort of come full circle because you're talking now about the importance of of business as a creative as you did when we opened the conversation and uh, Chris commented earlier on there he said that could be a handy course business acumen for creatives so maybe mm -hmm. that's the direction we'll be going in next 
but I think we're close to coming out of time now. And I really want to thank you, Harsh, for joining us today. I feel we've touched on so many aspects that I didn't quite know which direction we were going in. And uh, we've certainly looked towards the future of creativity. So in that respect, it's been a very exciting conversation. So thank you very much, Harsh. Thanks thank everybody who joined us today. And I uh, hope you will join us again for another 42 Courses Speaker. I just hope session. I didn't bore you guys that much. <laughs> Not at all. It was extremely interesting. So thanks very much, Harsh. And thanks, everybody who joined us. And see you, you again for another talk. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Harsh. You're amazing. Thank you so much. It was epic. <laughs> You're a legend. <laughs>